So, <clears throat> tonight, looking forward to what we're doing. I want to talk to you about um, lifelong living promises. And I have a particular humongous promise that God wants to give us. And then uh, I have a prophetic word. Just to keep you awake. Really. <laughs> But I want to start off by saying um, this is a great time for us. It's the right time. It's a brilliant time. And, you know, we are joint heirs in Christ and we're heirs of God. So from this time forward, a glow is practicing the art of air superiority. <laughs> air supremacy. That's what we're doing. We're going to learn how to fight in a different way. So we'll, you know, we'll be like this incredible charismatic air force. But also, we're going to learn to fight from our identity as joint heirs with Jesus. So that we are lifted out of the world's chaos into the kingdom provision that is available for every single one of us. You know, promises are given so that we can discover the power in God's relationship with his people. When God gives a promise, he gives everything that he is and everything that he has. And we learn the beauty of his nature in the way that he uses promises in our life. <laughs> Teresa and I, we have so many promises. It's like we're spoiled for choice. We don't know which promise to attack the enemy with on days. But it's fun. And the thing we love together as man and wife is we love encountering his unchanging love and the majesty of his righteousness towards us, that God can only see us in the right way. Imagine that. He can only look at you in the right way. He's full of righteousness, and righteousness is a gift to us. He can only think about you in the right way. He can only talk about you and talk to you in the right way. Why? Because he chooses to do everything right. He is righteous, and he loves being righteous. And it's a part of his unchanging nature. And the thing I love, that his unchangingness is the thing I think that makes me cry the most. My eyes leak almost every day. Just because <clears throat> when I think of his unchanging nature, feel incredibly safe. You always know where you are with God because he never changes. And his behavior towards you is not, his righteousness towards you is not based on your performance or your behavior. If you're good, bad, or ugly on days, he will be exactly the same towards you because he never changes. I love that about him. <coughs> Excuse me. I love the fact that I feel totally and completely safe. I always know exactly where I am in his heart. And, and the beauty about it too is that his covenant is not with you. It's with Jesus in you. There's a reason why God put Jesus into you. It's so that he could make a covenant with him that would include you even on the days when you were being followed around by the spirit of stupid. <laughs> he made a covenant with Jesus in you and he loves to keep that covenant. The Father loves Jesus in you and he loves who you're becoming in Jesus. Win-win. Jesus wins, we win, 
Father loves it. Holy Spirit, well, I mean, Holy Spirit is always happy about everything. So his promises become our permission to believe. His words never fail. <clears throat> and they're, they're built into his truth to us. They're built into his truth for us, in us, and through us. And everything in your life, <clears throat> every circumstance in your life, there are promises available for everything that's going on. Because as a people, we don't navigate through our life by problems or by crises or by chaos. We navigate through the promises and the prophecies that God has given us. We chart our course. Don't you love that, Jesus? When my daughter was around 11, I was meditating in my study at home and the door burst open. She jumps in, she stamps her foot. She says, Dad, I want you to have a word with that Jesus. I went, what's he doing now? He wants me to love a girl in my class who doesn't like me and she frustrates the heck out of me. I said, honey, I think you're going to have to work it out on your own. But ever since that point, Jesus has always been that Jesus. Sometimes in the office we're going like, sheesh, that Jesus. My God, brilliant. <laughs> I love that. I love it that every day we got something brilliant to look forward to just because he's around. And it doesn't matter what our circumstances are because we're not governed by our circumstances. We're governed by the promise that God gives us about them. Right? So he, he opens up our horizon all the time. He takes the blinders off. And he says, no, this is what we're doing. Now I want you to think about it this way. I want you to explore this promise with me because I'm going to open you up and give you some open heart surgery. I'm going to massage your heart. I'm going to get rid of all that fear, that worry, that angst, all that negative stuff that doesn't belong to you, by the way. It belongs to Jesus because he paid a price for it. So make sure you're not hanging on to stuff that belongs to him. Right? All your negativity belongs to him because he died for it. it yes, that is the best way to make him slightly annoyed. Is to be holding on to stuff that he robbed you of. Seriously, if Jesus took away all the sins of the world, what idiot brought them back? Really? What clown brought them back? I don't know what it's like for you, but in Santa Barbara, we have these amazing people who work for the city. And <clears throat> every Wednesday morning, they come and they take our trash away. I mean, it's like, it's amazing. Does that happen where you live? Sometimes. They take our trash away. It's brilliant. We put that bin out on the side of the road on a Tuesday evening and a Wednesday morning. We never see them, by the way. They're always so early. Wednesday morning, empty trash can, rubbish gone. Woohoo! It's like getting saved every day. <laughs> but can you imagine one evening, Wednesday evening, knock at the door, and it's a guy you haven't seen before, and he says, Hello, um, I'm your trash guy. I take away your trash every Wednesday, and, uh, you know, we really enjoy just taking it all and robbing you of it. But we just thought, you know, just for a change, we'd bring it back. So we couldn't find your bin, so we just laid it out on the lawn. And you've probably got a little bit from next door and a little bit from them. But anyway, you'll figure it out. If that ever happened, what would you do? You'd be straight on the phone. You'd be so irate, your voice would get so high-pitched that only dolphins could hear you. Say, do something. 
you'd be slightly annoyed, right? So why is it that we let the enemy bring back to us something that Jesus took away? I'm just asking. Just asking. We're so accommodating to the devil. Trash? That's my trash? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, well, I'll find a place to put it. Really? All that stuff belongs to Jesus. You're not allowed to have it. Bad Christian. (laughs) Bad. We are persuaded by promises. Just like Abraham. Listen to this. I'm going to read you from the Bible. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him who believed, even God. What's God believing about you? Have you worked it out yet? You want to know? Buy that flipping book. No, I'm kidding. God is believing something about you. And the whole art of walking with God is that you believe the same thing. So you're on the same page all the time. It's not rocket science. It's so simple, an Englishman can do it. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. That's like a Cleveland Browns win or something. (laughs) Apologies if you're from Cleveland. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it, really. In hope against hope, Abraham believed. He said he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. You know, God doesn't ask you to deny the existence of a negative. He just asks you to put it in the right place, in a place where you don't really have to consider it because the promise is so much bigger, so much more viable, so much more vibrant, so much more powerful, so much more beautiful, why would you want to even think about a negative? Thank you for the golf clap, I appreciate it. (laughs) Without becoming weak in faith, He contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. And then he thought about Sarah, and that was just killingly funny. It's like, I'm pretty sure her womb died. I think I heard it die once, like 20 years ago. And then he says this, yet with respect. Ah. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Excuse me. Come on, I know you kiss the Bible as well. Right? Promises highlight the absolute faithfulness of God to you. Everything in His nature, everything in His personality, everything in His heart. You know, God has a, such a massive heart. But he gives everything to you in that promise. It is unthinkable that you would not receive the fullness of that promise as you stand and walk in him. 
here's the thing for a lot of us, and I'm definitely got my hand up on this one. <clears throat> we pay more attention to the circumstances we're in than we do to the promise God is giving us. We have more respect for the thought that things may not work out, that the possibility of this is going to get bad, that the probability is, well, I don't know, this probably won't work for me. We have more respect around the negative than we do around God's kind intentions. We need to flip those around. God gave you a promise in the first place so that you could hold on to his faithfulness because he doesn't lie. He won't promise you something and not deliver. But you have to partner with him. And it's okay for you to consider stuff. Just don't give it any more power than it should have. Never give a problem more power than a promise. This is what we're learning now because we're all learning how to become joint heirs from this point on. And what I'm doing this evening is <clears throat> I'm going to give you a strategy, not just in your own personal life. I'm going to give a strategy for every lighthouse, for every region, for every nation in a glow in terms of how to get on the same page with God, how to walk with Him in full assurance of understanding, in complete confidence in who He is, and how to govern in your own life through the promises that God has given you. We need a strategy for the goodness of God. If we're going to be joint heirs, it is absolutely essential <clears throat> that we have this immaculate confession about goodness. Yeah. Here's where Teresa and I live at the moment. We made a decision a while back that we would never, ever allow ourselves to be challenged by a negative. That we were only going to allow ourselves to be challenged by the goodness of God. So we determined that every situation that was against us <clears throat> was actually a challenge from God to us to see how much we believed in His goodness. And also, it was a challenge to Himself, because He likes to partner with us. It was a challenge to Himself to really talk to us about, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be for you. <coughs> This is how I want to walk with you. This is the peace and the rest I want to give. I want you to enjoy this challenge with me. I want you to see everything as a challenge to my goodness in you. Which is just the, other, the flip side of the coin that everything is a possibility. Every situation in your life has possibilities for God to do all kinds of stuff. And where that takes you is it takes you into a place of confident expectation, what the Bible calls hope. And then if you're really bright, you'll actually move yourself along into anticipation, where you're looking ahead. And then on certain days when you realize, oh my God, I haven't had a problem for 17 days, what's going on? How am I supposed to grow up when I haven't got a challenge that brings me into a greater experience of goodness? And you can say, well, that's pretty out there thinking. But actually it isn't. It's just the mind of Christ. It's the way he thinks. Seriously, it's the way he thinks. <laughs> Listen. Don't mess with the prophet. Don't make me come down there. <laughs> Seriously. It is the way he thinks. And since you're being made in his image, it's the way all y'all are going to think. Right? This is what we've got to look forward to. 
We're going to blast to smithereens. I love that word, smithereens. Good old Irish word. I'd blast you to smithereens, so I will. <laughs> it's brilliant. We're going to blast to smithereens every ounce of negativity in your head, in your heart, in your little finger, wherever. Because you don't need it, so we need to give it back to the enemy and push it back. Because it's not ours, it's his. And we need to be taking on board who we are in Christ, who God wants to be for us, what he's making us into in terms of his likeness, and have a jolly good time. <laughs> And we're learning that the promise highlights the absolute faithfulness of God. And that teaches us how to hold fast the confession of expectation and not lose hope. That's Hebrews 10.23. We live in expectation that God's going to do something absolutely amazing. Promises are heaven's currency. They all carry a yes and amen in Christ. And we inherit them <clears throat> by faith so that we can believe in God joyfully. I can hear all the cogs going round in your head right now. Promises come in all shapes and sizes. But we need a few that are exceedingly great and precious to God. Otherwise, if some promises are not great, we won't see or experience how amazing He wants to be for us. I get persecuted a lot, which is a great pleasure. <laughs> I've had thousands, I don't know, I stopped counting at 50,000. I don't even know why I was stupid enough to count that far. But the number of hate mail I've had over the years, sad to say, I think it's declining. <laughs> Either that or Miss Jenny is hiding them somewhere. People writing, you know, like double-sided, 12 sheets, double-sided, closely typed, no paragraphs. You always know that it's a demon because they, they can't paragraph. <laughs> they, don't know, they don't understand punctuation or paragraphs. And so you will get like these letters, you know, cursing me and my family and all kinds of stuff and hope you die and gruesome death and, you know, telling you that you're the second cousin three times removed from Satan. <clears throat> really cute stuff. And there's a brilliant verse in 1 Peter 1 4. I'm going to read it. I like reading this. I like reading it to the Lord when I get a nasty letter. Lord, can I have some more nasty letters? That's so much fun. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. See, now that is brilliant thinking. It's like God saying, don't focus on being reviled. Dude, there's a blessing right next to it. There is no revulsion that can come into your life that doesn't have a blessing attached. This is what we're talking about. We're in the kingdom. Different rules apply. It's like the world is playing baseball, the kingdom's playing football. Somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> You're in the kingdom now, and there are different rules. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is on your side. So, <clears throat> if you are reviled <coughs> for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? 
because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I love going into my meditation space with a really ugly, horrible, demonic letter and then just putting it down on the table and saying, okay, Lord, read that. (laughs) Read that. And I'm just assuming the position. (laughs) Because I want the Spirit of God and of glory to rest on me. There's a reason why I have a brilliant, articulated view of who God is for me. It's because I get persecuted. I take advantage over what the enemy is doing. That's why I wrote a book, The Newness Advantage. Big clue. There are so many things in your life that God intends to turn around, open them up, so you can see the beauty and the power and the provision and the possibility and the promise that's actually in your life because of what the enemy is doing. All righty. <laughs> you guys are making me nervous. Spirit of God and of glory, rest on me right now, please. I feel like I'm being persecuted. Not really. <laughs> there are some promises that need to be, that will be so big they will take your breath away. You'll be, you'll be doing, you know, you'll be fluent in dolphin. Because you'll be going, what? Really? Yes. If you're living with someone wonderful, it's pretty important for you to have a sense of wonder. And not just, I wonder what's going to happen. Right? That's like base camp one on Everest. I wonder what's going to happen now. But a sense of wonder is you're awestruck by who God is. There's a reverence in your heart for the nature of God. And you have respect for everything that He says. Some of us, I think, you know, enjoy listening more to the enemy than we do to the Father. Because our ears seem always to be tuned towards the negative. Isn't there a problem that? Isn't there a worry that? Aren't you fearful about that? Well, no. Thanks for asking, (laughs) weird person. (laughs) Promises create attendant expectation. I love the fact that he loves to attach a promise to a problem. And he does it so that you can disempower your disappointment and refocus, recalibrate. That's what a promise does. It refocuses you. It recalibrates your thinking. It it gives you a fresh vision. And when you allow those things to happen, there's an expectation that rises up in you. There's a trust in you because you know that God is unchanging. And so you trust the nature of God. You know, most of us believe that God can heal. But our big question is, we're not sure whether He'll heal me. Right? So it's hard for us to have faith. It's hard to have faith when you haven't got trust. See, we trust in the nature of God. We trust in who He is for us. We trust in what God is being for us because He doesn't change. And when you can trust the unchanging nature of God, faith is easy. It's dead easy. I can do it. (laughs) Faith works by love. And love comes out of trust. Simple. your relationship with God is always wrapped up in the multiple acts of favor that he bestows on you in Jesus' name. Listen, if you're going to be as big as Jesus, 
you're going to have to have all the promises. He had over 300 prophetic words in his life. I'm only at like 47. I've got some growing up to do. You get all the promises that his father ever gave him. Jesus was rich the day after he was born. Because some weird king gave his dad a gold brick. Independently wealthy. (laughs) While he was still in diapers. As he is, so are we. Now you're all thinking, brilliant gold brick, and I'll ask for that, definitely. (laughs) Whatever. Ask for something. Here's the thing I like about promises. When you have a promise, there is no more need to take the problem to God. No more need. It robs you of that. We take our promises to God instead. That's why I like all the, you know, Lord, you said cards. Brilliant idea, Miss Kathy. Lord, you said cards. Lord, you said. I like that. I like taking out my prophetic words and say, <clears throat> what about this one? This is from 1979. What about that one? Lord, you said this. And you go, yeah, I like that one. It's not time yet. I like the one from 1984, though. How about we do that one? I write, all, I write everything down, God says to me. I write down every promise every prophetic word. <clears throat> and we have conversations about them on a very regular basis. Why? Because promises are currency in our life. When you have a promise, there's no more need to take the problem to God. We take the promises to Him instead. And we learn the language of joy and peace in believing. You know what promises does for me? It means I can live every day under the smile of God. Every day knowing exactly what his intentions are. Scripture talks about he does this for the, for the good pleasure of his will. He does this for the kind intentions of his will. I like living every day under the smile of God. In a chaotic world where everything is falling apart through greed, corruption, government ineptitude, we're not being challenged by evil. We're only ever being challenged by the goodness of God. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So I'm going to read a a prophetic promise has meant so much to me down through the years and it's never failed to deliver it's been one of my prime points of development in trust faith and experience of God so this is a promise that I'm now donating to a glow worldwide and it's going to be part of your training program for the next 12 months in lighthouses We're going to study this. It's got seven I will statements in it. It's a corker. We're going to study it. We're going to write prayers out of it. We're going to create expectations out of it. And here's the thing. You will be accountable for your expectations. I say that in the nicest possible way. Every lighthouse, we're going to be accountable for what we're learning. Why? Because we have to turn the tide. We have to reverse the flow. We have to send some goodness towards the enemy because it's really painful for him. We have to assault him with goodness. He can't handle anything like that. But we have to learn how to be provoked by the goodness of God. 
how to become profound in our relationship about the goodness of God. How to have a sense of such huge expectancy <clears throat> that we get turned into different men and different women. Our lighthouses become lighthouses. Places of promise, places of provision, places of possibility. And our thinking, our vision, our language gets adjusted upwards so we begin to live an elevated lifestyle. And then we begin to affect the people round and about us. We can affect people with the goodness of God. That's what Jesus did. He went about doing good. <clears throat> and then in our regions, in our leadership teams, every officer, anybody in any kind of position in the glow is going to be accountable for the people around them to make sure they come into something so profound and if you want to lead a mob like this into a whole new realm of goodness and power and expectation and faith and trust to the point where we are unstoppable, then you've got to keep ahead of that lot. I'm serious. I'm serious. We need, this is our next step up from life changers, game changers. This is an outcome of those two programs. This is an outcome of that training. That you come to a whole new place where you are never defeated again. Because the Father, the Father has never lost a fight. Jesus is undefeated and the Holy Spirit always leads us in triumph. And that's the side that you're on. Yes. And so what we need is an initiative in a glow that takes us out of, the, out of the basement into the penthouse. Takes us away from downstairs thinking into upstairs thinking. Takes us into the realm of Colossians 3. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So this is it. You ready? It is in Jeremiah 32, verse 38 to 41. <coughs> I love this. I'm going to kiss my Bible in two minutes. This is the Lord speaking. So it's a prophecy. They shall be my people. And I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way. That they may fear me always. That fear is reverential respect for the nature of God. That they will have reverential respect for me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. That means goodness is going to be eternal. It's going to be a constant. It's going to be a part of your relationship with Him that you have an expectation of goodness in your life because He's going to have an anticipation that He can do anything good in your life. So we're coming up to that level. I will not turn away from them to do them good. I will not stop doing you good. <clears throat> and I will put the fear of me in their hearts, the reverential respect for me in their hearts, so they will not turn away from me. That's one of the prayers I pray constantly throughout the day. Lord, thank you so much. You put, in, put your fear in my heart that I won't turn away from you. Put your reverence in my heart for the king and for the kingdom so I won't depart from you. I love that prayer. I must pray it, I don't know, 20, 30 times a day. Because I like it so much. I will rejoice over them to do them 
good <clears throat> and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. That's a promise and a half, eh? Hang on. <laughs> Nothing ambiguous in that promise. It's just seven I will statements. Let me read them out to you. I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will not turn away from them to do them good. I will put the reverence of me in their hearts so they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them and I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. That's unequivocal. Everything he is, is in that. It's like he's looking at you saying, I dare you to believe me. I remember that time I was in Sunrise and I had that prophetic word. And, and I heard it on the platform. And I said, you want me to say that? He said, yeah. You really want me to say that? Yeah. I mean, right now. Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I turned to Dan, and I just said, the Lord says, bankrupt me if you can. Pull on me to such a degree that if everyone pulls on God at the same time, <clears throat> There's going to be a run on the bank in heaven. <laughs> now that's a challenge. That's the Lord saying, challenge my goodness. Because you have to get a huge idea of what goodness looks like for you. This is personal. It'll be corporate for all of us, but it's deeply personal. Personal. You have to know the fullness of God's heart towards you in Jesus. We have to know. And we have to know it by experience. We have to have encounters with it. It has to become normal. It has to become commonplace. It has to get to the point where we're all talking about goodness and we're all, yeah, goodness, great, I love it. Normal. <laughs> Utterly normal, like there is no other life available to us except unending, everlasting goodness, because God is faithful. <laughs> there are going to be meetings where we're going to read this out together. Every time we get together, someone's going to read that scripture in your midst. In small groups, with family, with your friends, <clears throat> in your lighthouse, read it aloud. Meditate on it. Meditate on every I will statement. I guarantee you'll be right, you'll be filling up. You need to go back and buy some journals from the, the glow store. Because you'll be filling them up with promises, and, and, and God will want to specifically target situations in your life with goodness. He wants to overwhelm you. He wants to overpower you. He wants you to come to a place where you're so excited about a problem because of the kind intentions of God are so rooted in your heart, you can't think any other way. You can't see things any other way. And so you're going to be spending half your time rejoicing and the other half giving thanks and then occasionally praying out your expectation before God. But what you're never going to do is you're going to, you're going to stop praying like a widow. Stop that. Bad Christian. Stop it. That's my two-word counseling ministry. Stop it. And you're going to be praying like a bride. Someone living in a fullness of expectation. Does that sound too good to be true? If it isn't, I'm not doing my job properly. 
If it's not too good to be true, it's not God. If you're not overwhelmed, it's not God. If you're still living under a cloud and He's not the cloud, it's not God. God is going to deliver us into a state of mind so huge it will not only change you, it will change the streets where you live, the subdivision you live in, the town you stay in, the cities that you visit. Meditate on each I will statement. We're going to write prayers from this passage, crafted prayers that agree with your promise. <coughs> and we're going to learn to pray in line with God's will in a whole new level. But more than that, this next time frame, we need to train everybody in a globe to live, <coughs> to learn how to stand and live in the goodness of God. And so our questions are going to be, so what good, what, what's happening right now? What's the goodness that you're praying for? What's the goodness that you're expecting? Let's have a look at that prayer. Maybe we should upgrade this prayer. And so a spirit of proclamation needs to come on every one of us. Great expectations about constant, consistent goodness. And then we're going to practice goodness to everybody around us. No one's going to be safe from a blessing. Doesn't matter who they are. The best fun of all is when you get to bless your enemies. People who don't like you. That's a good day at the office. And then you bring it. It's like bring that goodness. And you get together in your groups... And when you come in, you put your goodness together as individuals into the corporate hat and you declare from that place of corporate understanding of what goodness really is. And we expect things to be released. We expect things to happen. Because that's what God is training us for. Take it in your place of work. Take it across your neighborhood. And the question you need to be asking is, what will God rejoice to be for you and to do for you? What would make him happy? If he's practicing goodness on you, he's got designs on you. He's got plans. I know the plans I've got for you. Plans for your welfare, not your calamity. No chaos in the kingdom, just goodness. And that goodness makes us so remarkable to God and therefore remarkable to people round and about us. We're going to get a crash course in what goodness really looks like. We're going to come to a deeper level of assurance in Him. And our groups across this great ministry, we're going to fill our groups with the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His goodness. And in every region, we need to take inventory of God's acts of goodness. We need to start recording it, state to state, city to city, lighthouse to lighthouse, making a record of the acts of goodness. Because what are you doing? You are formally writing down your history about going to the next level. And anybody who comes into a glow in the next five, ten years, is going to come into that history. They're they're going to come onto that platform. They're going to read your history. They're going to read your testimony. And then they're going to follow that road because they won't know any other. Wouldn't it be great that every state wrote a book about what God did. About, and then, but halfway through, the book changed to be not just a record of what God did for you, but actually a record of what he plans to do in that state. Then we could mail one off to the governor. 
right? We can give them to the mayor in your town. This is what God is doing. We are here. I have my own theory about this time in the book of Acts when <clears throat> it says um, people were saying the people who turned the world upside down are here also. I remember I heard it a few times like, you know, the world was going, oh my God, they're here. The people who turned the world upside down, they're here also. I don't read it like that. I read it like there were people because the fame of Israel went out across the world, right? The fame of what Jesus was doing is going out. And people would see Christians coming. And then they would go around and start knocking on doors. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! They're here! Ah! They're here! They're here! The people who turn the world upside down, they're here! Oh my God! Everything's going to be okay now. Everything's going to be okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. My dad can get healed. My mom. Oh my God. My brother can get a job. The lazy what name? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is amazing. The people who turn the world upside down with the goodness of God, oh, they just moved into our street. Oh my God. We need to give them a week to settle in and then throw a block party. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? To me, this is like the most powerful way for the church to get her respect back in the world. That we believe in something so powerful, so amazing, it changes everything and it's changed us. Yeah, I'm telling you, there are going to be times when we're going to come around and take the temperature in your state. <laughs> we're going to see if it's hot, red hot, or white hot. <clears throat> Lukewarm is not a temperature. Here's the thing. This is a lifelong promise. And by it, we can measure the growth of trust and faith in people. We can measure the growth of the kingdom in families, in groups, in regions, across the nations where a glow is represented. This is where we can put a finger on the pulse of life in a glow. Right across the work we represent. We can measure the quality even of the leadership gift that we have and we need to do that because <clears throat> we're raising up an army to take the promised land to turn America into the promised land to turn any nation we're in into a land of promise so we need leaders who can do that we need people who can follow that We need people in a glow to take responsibility for God's promises and for the prophecies. It can't just be Jane's job. She's like one of the best in the world for me of always remembering promises, always calling them out, always talking about them. But we all have to be that good. We all have to be saying, this is our currency. This is our trust. This is our faith. This is our place. This is our position in the kingdom. And therefore, it's our governance in the earth. We need to fan the flames of trust and faith. We need to be thrust into places of experience and encounter in the kingdom in the places where we live, in our very hearts. At the very least, the first thing that should disappear is every single negative 
we should stab it in the throat. I like that idea. So, okay, let me finish by prophesying. Ready? Put everything down. Assume the position. Hands out. Stupid look on your face. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> calling this prophecy intentional inheritance beloved I am determined to build a house in the earth a temple of goodness so tall its light will be seen in the highest and the lowest of places goodness shall be the antidote to greed and self-preservation. Goodness will form the building blocks of trust and faith that shall make a way for untold millions to find their way into the kingdom because it was the goodness and the kindness of God in and through His people that drew people into the kingdom. Real growth, says the Lord, comes from the questions you ask me. Not from the circumstances that question you. Fullness is the only certainty in life. And I speak these words over you so that my joy may be in you and that that joy will be full and you will learn to live every day under my smile and when the enemy comes calling I'll be the one that's laughing and you'll be the ones that are grinning and laughing with me I am commissioning you to cultivate goodness in your life in your city in your region by partnering with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in these days of chaos, it shall be the evidence of being in Christ, of living in the new man. I am banishing measure from your midst. Measure cannot handle the chaos that is released upon the earth. Only a life focused on goodness and fullness can fully inherit all that heaven is releasing into the earth. Only the beloved will grasp the good pleasure of my will. My people, do not disown my glory. You are not the same as everyone else. And so you will prove. You're being changed from glory to glory so that the bride will begin to be revealed in and through a state of astonishment. And the astonishment in the world will provoke a harvest of souls so enormous It will change goat nations into sheep nations. Goat cities into sheep cities. And the Lord says, if you will it with me, no one will be safe from the goodness of God. The goodness of God will override and overrule and govern every area. And the stories of glories must be recorded and sent around the world. <clears throat> In goodness shall there come a union between the head and the body, and the mindset of the bride shall speak from a new realm of anointing. Behold, I give you more promises than you will ever need. And we will create a new economy built 
on strategic extravagance of God in the earth. And the power of the kingdom will overwhelm around the world. Beloved, this promise is deeply personal to me. It's personal for you, my people. And it carries my guarantee. My word will not return to me empty. <clears throat> it will accomplish my purpose. If you let go of it, others will pick it up. So that the promise will succeed in the matter for which I sent it. Let the promise impregnate your secret place so that it comes to fruition in you. It is vital to me that you allow these promises to put you ahead of worldly matters so that you are ahead of the curve so that in the news there will be real news of unprecedented acts of goodness unprecedented upturns in economies miracles of provisions that make the feeding of the 5,000 look like the Mad Hatter's Tea Party you will become the bandwagon that people will want to jump on. And as world events darken the landscape, your light of goodness will open the heavens. Blessing, favor, miracles, and resources will flow into the places that connect with the kingdom. And the church will no longer be in recovery. Instead, it will bear the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, 4. That in goodness, you will rebuild the ancient ruins. In the promises of God, you will raise up the former devastations. In the enormous provision of the kingdom, you will repair the ruined cities. And the goodness of God will touch the desolation of many generations. We are in an unprecedented time together. Some of us have been training for this all our lives. To live for something so profound, so enormous, it dominates us. We become obsessed about the goodness of God. This is the right time for us to step into this place because the world is in chaos but not us never us we're in the kingdom and and his promise to us is as he is meaning Jesus so are you in this world let's pray Father I thank you I can feel your smile right now you love this stuff you love giving us something enormous to do you love giving us something unprecedented to believe <clears throat> and you're so confident in yourself. You plan to enjoy every second of this with us. Because this is where you get to do what you've always wanted to do. Commit us to a life of transformation. Commit us to a lifestyle of transformation. Renew our minds every single day. So we represent your beauty, your holiness, your goodness, your kindness. And we become as unchanging as you. So Father, here we are. 
and we're all a little overawed by you, but then you like that too. You love showing yourself to be big. You walk to and fro throughout the earth looking for a people on whose behalf you can show yourself strong. Well, here we are. Here we are, Lord. This year is going to be the most unprecedented couple of years in our life. There is a quickening spirit on this ministry. We're not going to take a year just to get started. We're going to get started and see how fast we can get there. You know that Lamborghini I'm always talking to you about? Now will be a good time. Because I want to go as fast as I can into this place. And I sense in your own heart a beautiful, divine impatience that you want to take us there. You're hungry to see us living in you in that way. You hunger and thirst for us to know you in fullness. And so, Lord, we say, okay then. Uh uh. Uh uh. That's not a glow. We say, (laughs) All righty.